four chapters, uh, I think chapter six through chapter ten. Uh, but in our last class, uh, we were dealing with uh, the attorney client privilege and work product doctrine, which allowed us to compare what we had been doing at the 1.6 confidentiality and keeping our client's confidences about things relating to the representation. So we did that. Uh, and then we started talking about the attorney client privilege and work product doctrine, starting on page uh, 155. And we made comparisons, of course, between the confidentiality and privilege. However, the confidentiality is broader, <coughs> arises from the ethical rules. Privilege is more rules of evidence or civil procedure. Uh, usually derive privilege from litigation or some type of procedural context where you're being compelled uh, to disclose something about you, what you said to the client, attorney client privilege, or what you worked on, work product privilege. Uh, and we went from there and we talked about the components of the attorney client privilege, communication between privileged persons, communication and confidence, and then seeking legal advice. From there we talked about waiver, how uh, the attorney client can be waived with everything from someone being in the room that's unauthorized to give this confidential conversation uh, to the client saying, okay, we want to waive this privilege, go to advance the litigation. Uh, and we also talked about the crime fraud exception on page 165. Certainly can give legal advice, but not uh, tangled up with a criminal activity. And we noted that that sort of resonates with what we have under the model rules. You can't assist uh, a client's fraud or fraudulent activity by using your, uh, your legal services in order to do that. Uh, then we talked about the secret confession on 167. Sort of an unsatisfactory result uh, because you're faced with this choice whether to reveal or not. We noted uh, previously how long this confidence lasts. You see on page 166, the attorney client privilege remains in force even if revelation will prevent the wrongful incarceration or execution of an innocent person. And it remains in effect even if the client dies. So I know there's a famous uh, case with Vince Foster, and they tried to get his uh, client uh, confidences and discussions and work product with the attorney before he committed suicide. The court says no, the privilege outlives the client. You may ask, well, what type of reputational interest are you protecting? I think it's a, a broader a system interest that we want clients to feel free uh, that their reputation and confidences will be protected at all costs. And we noted that even under Rule 1.6, there's comment 20 uh, that talks about that as well. Uh, and there's no time limit. You see that it just goes on. The duty of confidentiality continues after the client lawyer relationship has terminated. So even under 1.6, comment 20, you have this duty to preserve confidences lasting indefinitely. Uh, and that leads us up to, I don't think we talked about up, John, starting on page 171, but you know that it rejects the control group test. Long ago, it used to be, well, we protect uh, confidences within the corporation, but only with people, high level managerial authority. The US Supreme Court looks at that and said that's unrealistic to, uh, an unrealistic way to look at the structure of a corporation because you have middle managers and even lower level employees who can bind the corporation by their actions. So that case rejects the control group test and looks at a subject matter test. In other words, the scope of the privilege depends upon the subject matter, not who is communicating. So we don't give the CEO or Bob in the uh, files office if, if we're talking about something that can bind the corporation, that's gonna change our analysis. Because communication between lower level, lawyer, lower level employees and lawyers uh, who had knowledge uh, of something uh, could be privileged. Uh, now, to set up this last problem that we have to deal with on page 174, uh, there is a practice by the US Attorney's Office or Government Office that says we're gonna seek waiver of corporate privilege in exchange for lesser penalties. And so, that brings up a number of complicated issues. Can the government force a counsel to give up privileges? Does that undermine the attorney-client relationship in exchange for a uh, lesser penalty? And this sort of was in the Justice Department and went back and forth, and uh, there were some policies during the Bush administration that said, uh, okay, we're not gonna lean on uh, opposing counsel in such a way to totally obliterate the attorney-client privilege. We're only gonna request voluntary waiver of the attorney-client privilege when there's a legitimate law enforcement uh, purpose. Uh, but then the question is, how far do you, do you go in order to allow disclosure? And on page 174, you have uh, an example of that. On page uh, uh, 174. So, problem four two. Worldwide bribery. So we have to set up how we deal with this. What should we do? And notice uh, in this case, starting on page 174, uh, what we're dealing with. So we have a number of things. We have a corporation. We are in the corporation. We have to figure out who we represent. And we have the situation where there is criminal conduct. We have to figure out uh, how to deal with it. U.S. Attorney wants to know all the facts. And that sounds like a legitimate uh, request because remember, we said that uh, underlying facts are privileged. But in divulging those underlying facts, are we going to undermine the attorney client privilege? So this is on page 174. Uh, we're counsel of Horizon Corporation, no company, Horizon, uh, publicly traded company, manufactures cell phones, and we're told that officers of the corporation have been directly bribed to officials and foreign governments in violation of U.S. law. And so the argument is that uh, this is just the cost of doing business. You have to uh, deal with bribes in different countries, and that's what we do. And so I guess everyone at least implicitly knows that this is what we're doing. On the top of page 175, we have uh, Valerie Patel, who is the president. She knew about the bribes and condoned them. Through our investigation, we uh, verified that officers of the company had engaged in rampant bribery. And so we have conducted these interviews, and the interviews come back and they say, well, the president knew about this as well. Uh, we write a report about an investigation, send it to Patel, and our report begins with the words, this report is covered by the attorney, client, and work product privilege. So our communications, our strategy, everything that we've done in terms of consulting with the corporation, we're saying is protected. That's gonna be at the top margin of it. Uh, the report summarized all of the facts that we learned, concluded that the corporation, notice this, within the context of the document, we're saying that the corporation probably committed several felonies. And we should be vulnerable to severe penalties if this comes out. The report also warns that if we turn this over to prosecutors, stockholders may sue the company. And if we turn it over, that may waive the attorney-client privilege once we turn it over. And attachments to the report include all the interview summaries that our staff made and the corporate records that they collected. We decide with Patel to jointly send out a memo to all corporate employees directing them not to participate in any more bribery. So we're trying to mitigate uh, what has been going on, even in countries where bribes are accepted as routine practice. 
So we sent out this memo saying, don't do this anymore. Uh, then we agreed that we would contact the U.S. attorney. And then the general attorney says something bad has happened. Maybe we can uh, pay a fee, and this thing goes away. That'd be great. U.S. attorney, of course, is inviting it and says, okay, yeah, thanks for telling me, but I want all the facts, all the facts, uncovered in our internal investigation, including summaries of the interviews that we conducted and all of the relevant documents, so those attachments that we took. Uh, he says he is confident that Horizon would want to cooperate with the investigation, and if, you, if we cooperate, we're going to receive favorable consideration. Now, notice he's very careful because of this Justice Department memo. He says, I'm not asking you to waive the attorney-client privilege. That would be wrong. We would be forcing you to uh, undermine your relationship with your client. What we are asking for is all the facts. Once all the facts are claimed, he's not asking for a waiver of the attorney-client privilege. But, and this, this is sort of the pressure point, uh, if your client can provide these interview summaries, he says, uh, and records of bribery, we're going to open up our own investigation. You can expect to receive a grand jury subpoena. And we will take the cooperation, the corporation lack of disclosure and co cooperation into account just as we would any other uh, criminal defendant. So that's a nice way of threatening you, but saying, you know, we're not asking you to waive or undermine the attorney-client privilege. If you don't co cooperate, you're just going to be like every other uh, uh, criminal defendant that does not cooperate. So your best interest is to cooperate, and you can do so, the U.S. attorney says, by revealing all of the facts. So it says at the bottom of page 175, after tearing some of your hair out, Patel asked, after tearing some of her hair out, Valerie Patel asked you to advise her about what she should do. What should we do? What should be our approach here? So I, I guess I'll put it like this. this is a, are you going to let yourself be pushed around just because this is the U.S. attorney? I mean, we are an attorney for this corporation. What kind of conversations do we have to have first? So before we even notice that this is real life, so before we even consider our options, what type of things should we say to the president of the corporation, Valerie Patel? To be, uh, try to be selective in what I turn over. So this would help me. Uh, this would help me avoid grand jury investigation. That's good. Hopefully, cooperate. And that's good. Is that a good option? Uh, cooperation in this case may be uh, um, cooperation 
cooperation may lead to negative consequences for the corporation, for the client corporation. So notice a lot of this is taking a step back. You get this demand from the U.S. Attorney's Office, that doesn't mean spring in action, get all the documents in the document production and turn them over. We review the documents in relation to what the U.S. Attorney is asking for. All the facts is a nice request, but it is, it's broad because those underlying facts are connected to things that you have talked to the corporation about in confidence. So that can undermine the attorney-client privilege as well as work product and strategies and that, because all those things concern the underlying facts. So there has to be a clear distinction between uh, underlying facts Underlying facts which are discoverable and protected. I'll just put protected attorney client communication. So that's good. So our duty is to the company, not the officers, and not even to the president of the corporation individuals. And we want to make the prosecution's job hard on some level because we have to protect our clients' interests. So you said waiver is not a good idea. Well, what are our other options? What would you do? We tried to cooperate and thought about that and said, yeah, maybe I'm just comfortable. It's supposed to ask you to clarify what they mean by all the facts so we can see what it would be able to information. Okay, you asked me, I'm the U.S. Attorney. Okay, yeah, I know what you mean about clever because I want all the facts. I want everything that's good that you can tell me. And, and, and the more facts you tell me, the more I'm going to be looking at your cooperation, and that's going to lead me to be even more lenient. So all the facts means all. I'll just respond by saying all. That's what I mean, all of it. I know, exactly. That's right. And, and that's the way to respond. I want it all. I'm not asking you to violate the attorney client privilege, but I want it all. You, you know all the good facts. Like, uh, tell me about these countries, and tell me about how the bribes were done, and tell me the amounts. Tell me everything. Okay, I'll clarify it even better. Tell me everything factually that you uncovered in these interviews inside the corporation. See, that doesn't ask you to give anything up in terms of attorney client privilege or anything. You, and I'll say this to you, you can even segregate all of the good uh, protected information. I'm not, I want you to just go through all your interviews and pull out all the facts that I might be interested in. And the things that I'm interested in are, are things that show that the corporation is vulnerable to liability. I want you to be forthright with me. You've already admitted that you're involved in this conduct. If you're forthright with me and tell me all of the facts, I will be extremely lenient. And if you're not, I'm going to treat you just like any other defendant. Like any other criminal defendant. You're no more than a the bank robber than me if you don't cooperate. But it's your decision. So we don't want to give up too much. That's one way to look at it. What about, uh, not giving, go ahead. I always want to go through my own investigation and say no, and I'm not scared. Like, that's you, you, you said I'm not scared, I'm scared, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what made you sort of, I'm not, what did you say that? Once someone's asking, like, well, you just tell us, and it will make it easier on you. Yeah. So, you can go into that investigation and get that further. Okay. Okay, that's good. So, that was a good, strong, courageous move, I like it. Uh, <laughs> but, are there any consequences? See, and I, what I'm getting at is all this is about assessment of risk. So you took the brave fourth right stand. I think you do have to fight this on some level. I think total waiver is bad. I think we see that. That opens up everything. So we have to fight on some level. And I guess uh, option two and option three is going to be how much do we fight? Option two, this option two, you said, well, do not waive the privilege. Do not make it easy to prosecute. But what are the risks? Do you have any concerns? Yes, because we actually did it. So like, it's luckily going to be edited about it. It's just that we did it in the trial audit. Okay. So what would you do then? <laughs> well, think about the offices, and you know, there were, and we can't really tell because this is a hypothetical. But in real life, we'll be able to assess uh, how strong they are about moving forward. You know, how many cases they have? Have they done this in the past? Just taking an assessment about opposing counsel and their willingness to go forward. Just yeah, go ahead. I was just going to suggest, in that event, uh, just kind of taking proactive steps in the company to try to make sure that nothing was currently happening, not so as to cover up what had previously happened, but maybe as evidence of like, you know, once this came to light in the legal department, you know, we took action to make sure it stopped, and you know, kind of showing good faith, whether that means you know, like changing department heads or uh, you know, in general, just like intercompany. Okay, that's good. So you, you would uh, be looking at the rules and our conduct under, under it. You want to be making a strong argument that as soon as we found out about it, uh, we took steps to mitigate, uh, eliminate, and remedy the situation, and that's going to help us with uh, further negotiations with the U.S. Attorney. That's good. Moving forward. But what about this risk about saying we're not waiving anything? We're going to keep this information. We're not going to make it easy for you to prosecute. That, that may make them uh, a bit angry because we're not rolling over. Uh, but that's a risk you take, sort of assessing the strength of the U.S. Attorney's office. Maybe, and this isn't a hypothetical, but this certainly would be a consideration in real life. Maybe. Uh, the U.S. Attorney has scarce resources and they can't just go down this road. Maybe it might be beneficial for both sides to settle this. So we might come back around again uh, with an offer to settle. You know, in, in, in that way, maybe that would be connected to those settlement uh, discussions would be related to give and take between uh, the corporation and the U.S. Attorney. Go ahead again. I have a question. Um, when you represent, so like in this case, you don't represent any of those individuals. Right. So what information is actually privileged? If, I guess I, I'm just asking this in general. Like when you represent a corporation and interview employees and officers, what sub actually privileged if you don't have a person? Yeah, so the, the information belongs to the corporation. We're protecting the corporation. Uh, we know that we need people to make corporations work. Uh, not apart from citizens. Not. This is sort of just uh, 
we need people to make this inanimate object work. So all of those confidence and things go to the corporation. So the general counsel is going to make a decision, uh, and that's why we had this discussion with Valerie Patel. Everything that she does uh, can be reflected on the corporation, uh, and so that's the information that we're going to protect. In this situation, though, we would we would say further that she should get independent counsel, and, and independent counsel will look out for her individual interests. And, and I think oftentimes it's, it's clear to see where the interests diverge. We're doing everything in the best interest of the corporation. So we know about all of these things that happen uh, bad that she condoned. Uh, we may have to interpret that information in a way that's beneficial to the corporation, but leaves her out in the call. And so notice we both have that same pool of facts, but we're interpreting it differently. So that's why I'm saying all this information belongs to the corporation. Our client, uh, she is with us when, when we're moving the client in the right direction. Uh, but our interests diverge when we have to protect the corporation over her. Okay, so yeah. then the, if you're representing the corporation, couldn't you say by disclosing whatever you find out for her or the other officers, you are looking out for the best interests of the corporation? Yes. Not really. I don't know, do anything ethical. Oh yeah. So what do you, what, what you mean by the ethical point? Tell me. Like I don't think could you get in trouble for violating an ethical rule? <laughs> So this, this is why we did this informed value for that yeah. we represent the corporation, and I should put up here, you're right, and get independent, and, and, and when our interests diverge, or even before that, when our interests diverge, it will be necessary for you to have independent counsel. So notice, that this information belongs to both of us, I guess. It's all about the rise and everything. But she certainly wants to interpret differently. She wants to say, I was under pressure. I'm looking at the reports. I need to do business in these, in these countries. Bribe is an accepted business practice, even though it goes against uh, rules and regulations. Everyone does it. We get it out in the open, and this is what we did. Uh, and we want to say, well, we are under this pressure. When your attorney's office gets ruined, corporate interest, shareholders are going to look at this. We have to protect the corporation. Substantial uh, financial harm could happen. Uh, someone has to take the blame for it. Uh, your unilateral decision put us in a position. So we have the same facts, but different interests. And so that's why this was still fine. You, you, you would be ethical if you say this up front. You would have to. But that's why this waiver uh, scenario was, was bad too, because this is gonna, if we turn over this information, it's gonna open it up, not only to Patel, but everyone else who participated in it. And they're gonna have to get independent uh, counsel as well, because we represent the corporation. Uh, and hopefully, this, uh, this, hopefully us as general counsel didn't know anything about it, we didn't participate in this. Because if we did, that, that opens up a, another uh, set of problems. Uh, what else? You know, even if we do turn over this, these files, there's no guarantee, uh, when will the government stop? So once we go down this road, it can get bigger and bigger, and that's my point about the uh, going into uh, other areas. So we have do not waive, maybe accept a settlement. What about a middle ground approach? So we take this risk, we might say, well, the U.S. Attorney's Office is swamped. Uh, they might not go this far. Maybe offer to settle, help both parties move on. But that's a risk we have to take. Maybe uh, we can have it both ways. What about a middle ground approach? I, I tried to sort of do the middle ground approach when I said waiver, and then I'll just pick and choose uh, which type of uh, documents I'll turn over and I'll be okay. Uh, so maybe a better, Maybe a better approach would be, I turn all, over all factual information and incriminating statements, but I, w I will follow the, cover, the covering memo in which I say uh, that the corporation had probably violated the law. So in other words, I don't give uh, the portion that sort of summarizes everything and says, yeah, we probably did. Don't turn that over. I just turn over uh, everything that's factual in the interview. What about that? Mr. Johnson, go ahead. I was thinking something like, maybe go through all the materials you have and um, just take out anything that you think might be privileged or work product, which would be like the interviews and everything, and then kind of give them, you know, like a pile of documents. It's probably pretty useless, but on face, like you're still cooperating, and then that kind of leaves a window for them to come back with a more specific request. Uh huh. Which oh. I think is what you want anyway. That's interesting. Let me, let's be careful. So you said a pile of documents is meaningless. What do you mean? Like, that, I mean, that mean they they want, but you, still, like, you kind of have like taken out all the stuff they really want, but I mean, you're still kind of cooperating, so there's still like a back and forth going on. No, no, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> Get a little bit, so uh, you would turn over stuff, would this stuff be relevant or kind of relevant, or you just pick it to and give them something and you know that they're gonna come back and then you'll yeah. probably give them something a little bit better. Yeah, I did, I'm relevant, but not enough to like yeah. make a case out of it. Yeah, yeah, so you have to be careful in discovery. Yeah. So you know this from civil proceedings and all that. You, get, like, uh, you have to respond uh, in, in, in good faith. So, so uh, discovery is supposed to be, you don't do the other side's job for them, but you have to respond effectively to requests. So hopefully it doesn't get to the point where uh, you file a Rule 37 motion to compel. Hopefully it doesn't get that far. But if you do have that a motion against you, then you have to respond in a way, give them what they ask for. Uh, you can't say, well, that document doesn't exist, and it does exist. Uh, you can't say this is going to do burdensome, we can't find it, that type of thing. Uh, but there has to be a good faith effort to uh, answer this discovery request. So another middle ground approach could be uh, just give them the underlying factual material. But we already talked about how, how dangerous that would be. Uh, <coughs> so if you're saying, well, what's the right answer? There is no right answer to this one. Like a lot of things in practice. You, we've done the things that will protect us as attorneys from making any rules violations. We've told Patel who we represent. We have considered the consequences. I don't think full waiver is a good approach. You probably should be somewhere over here. Don't make it easy for them. Try to make offers to settle. Because once you waive the privilege, you're going to open it up more and more. And, and there's no way really to effectively pre predict how wide open that will be. So maybe you can, a middle ground approach is, that's not really a satisfactory resolution either because you're still faced with uh, more discovery and broader inquiries by the U.S. Attorney. So you can just give them factual information and incriminating statement, <coughs> but withhold covering memo 
committing public government. So, but still, you're still dealing with uh, how the U.S. attorneys want to approach this. So, I guess the the answer, there's no real good answer, is uh, not to waive everything. Continue to have those conversations without waiving the privilege and see where that takes you. Uh, because once you do waive the privilege, uh, it's going to open up more uh, inquiry by U.S. attorneys. But you do have some leverage because they don't know everything. You still have the information. And so, uh, what will give you leverage is how you handle that information. So, that's chapter four. Chapter five. Relationships between lawyers and clients. So, this chapter, we're going to do a number of different things. Now, one major thing we're going to get from this class interesting is that, and I want you to be aware of this, this is very important, uh, particularly for uh, people who are going to be in smaller legal offices or solo practitioners. You can establish an attorney client relationship without any money exchanging hands, without any formal contract, without a retainer, without saying the magic words, I am going to represent you as your attorney. Be very careful of that. And so, this case that we're going to look at in a, in a little while uh, talks that as a perfect, paradigmatic example of that. Because you have an attorney and a client thinking very differently about representation, the scope of representation, and how they operate. So you know, all the way up to this point, the first five chapters have on some level tried to define the attorney-client relationship. What that is, what it means, how it works. And so the reason that we're doing this like piece by piece and looking at these components is because when we start talking about conflicts, conflicts is gonna break apart everything that we've done in the first chapter, everything that we've done in establishing uh, the attorney-client relationship. So when we talk about a uh, relationship, We're talking about elements of the attorney-client relationship. One thing we're going to do is elements of the attorney-client relationship. I just put it <coughs> How the attorney-client relationship is formed. Uh, how the relationship is established. A little bit of uh, agency law. We are the uh, agent of, I'm sorry, yeah, we are the agent of the client, the client is the principal. It's thus an implied authority. Oh, that's actual authority. Then you have uh, apparent authority. Then we're also going to look at competence, our first rule. We're going to look at candor. We're going to look at communication. We're going to look at diligence. So starting on page 177, we sort of have this, this outline of uh, what we're going to talk about. And page 178 sort of talks about what I just talked about. But let's get to this case, talks that on page 183. So I just told you that a person can become a client without signing a contract or giving money. And so if this case represents anything to you in terms of uh, taking away a proposition, a practical proposition. That proposition is this. You have to be careful about how you conduct the preliminary interview. Because, you know, if you look at the, the, yeah, the transcript of this case and the questions that were asked, you see that the client and the attorney have completely different interpretations about the scope of representation and about the relationship itself. And so that's what drives this problem. So this case is good in a number of different ways. It, it does a couple of things. So it tells us about the formation of the attorney client relationship. Gonna tell us uh, about malpractice claim. <coughs> court or contract. Most of the time malpractice claims be towards contract, breach of fiduciary duty. They're, they're all interrelated, but you'll just see in this case, uh, the court sort of looks at, uh, under contract or tort theory, uh, we, we, we're looking at malpractice. So there's that. And then uh, the practical implications of how an attorney conducts the initial interview. That's what we want to focus on now. So someone take you through the facts and tell me what happens in this case. This is bad on the own. Another thing, competence. Yeah. Okay. What about that? What about the facts here? Why are you talking before? 
you have a long weekend coming, you should be happy about that. You just really participating, Pastor. You know, tomorrow is off and then you off Monday too. So what about that? What about Costa? Yeah. Uh, so oh. going to Costa has in Hawkeye with like probably brain injuries um, and every time his wife I come back, things just seem to have gotten worse. Uh, and the nursing staff hospital job I'm really here remember. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she consulted with um, John Costa about everything that's going on and he went to meet with uh, yeah, he went to meet with her and uh, testified about everything that happened in the hospital and her concerns and the whole time uh, she was trying to take notes uh, and then there had been no fee discussion, so it was never said that, that he was going to represent her and her husband or just her other guest. Um, uh-huh. And she didn't consult with any other attorney about it either until a year after that. Uh-huh. Uh, Okay, so why didn't she consult with any other attorney until a year after that? That seems to be on her. If you don't get a satisfactory answer, it seems like, and, and nothing really happens, it seems like you would just go somewhere else if you're not, just like shopping, if you don't like what they have or somewhere else. What about that? Uh, she realized that, like his legal advice, that they didn't have a case, so she didn't take out going to do it anywhere else. Okay, we're going to come back to that. That's a big mistake. Uh, so, commenting on the merits of the thing, I don't think you have a, a case. I'll get back to you if you do. She doesn't hear anything she relies upon. I don't think you have a case. And, and since he doesn't get back to her, she assumes that uh, she doesn't have a case. Waits a year, of course, you know what happens. Statute of limitation runs, uh, and then is foreclosed from getting any uh, type of recovery. So that, that's going to bring us to the malpractice claim. But before we even do that, let's uh, break this uh, interview apart. You see on page 184? So Tom's dad is injured, as just Paula talks about. Uh, he is uh, probably because of the clamp. We don't know. Uh, people are acting weird. So his wife and, I guess, one of his supervisors at work, they go to uh, the attorney's office. This is on page uh, 184. So notice this. This is 14 months after her notice of hospitalization. Joan talks that meets with this attorney, Jerry Miller, and she takes along her husband's work supervisor, Ted Buckhouse. So two things jump out at me uh, there. So they come to your office and they say it's been 14 months uh, since the hospitalization and you have this other party accompanying the prospective client. What kind of things do you want to talk about right off the bat in this interview? What do you want to say? Uh, who are you to? Like, who are you to? Right, because we're talking about attorney-client privilege. We want to make sure this is uh, someone necessary. Are you on the same page? We don't, even, we don't want to waive anything. Nothing has really started yet, but we want to know that. And these 14 months, one of the first things you say is we have to check on the statute of limitations because uh, the clock is ticking. It's been a year and two months since the event has occurred. Uh, another thing, do you think the attorney should have said, uh, I don't think you have a case, but if you do, I'll get back to you? Is there anything wrong with that? Miller took notes and asked questions during the meeting. Lasts only 45 minutes to an hour. And Ms. Talks there says that the attorney said, he did not think we had a case, however, he was going to discuss it with his partner. And that's the partner who later gives advice, uh, gives testimony on his behalf that really turns out to be uh, devastating because he actually agrees with the plaintiff's experts about the standard that an attorney has to meet. So what about this? Would you say something like this? I don't think you have a case, but I'll get back to you. Anything wrong with that? Yeah, this one? Uh, yeah, like, if he didn't think there was a case, then it should have just been, like, what, I mean, like, a statement, not, I'll get back to you, because he's getting back to the parts that you relied on, so he said, I don't think you have a case, then it might be a little different, but you expect him to be called back and just say, at least you don't have anything to do. Now, so I agree with that, uh, yeah, calling back, there's a communication issue, I agree with that, but even commenting on, I don't think you have a case, is that, yeah, what? Uh, I would have said, you should, like, recommend Okay. Your personal. Okay. So, what if you what if you see that this could be lucrative? Though, and you kind of want to hold on to it. Uh-huh. So, it, I guess what we're saying there has to be a certain level of preparation before you comment on the merits of the claim, uh, and uh, it's, it's problematic. I think if he had gotten back to her, that that would have helped the thing. But you set up a, a reliance interest when you say I'm commenting on the merits. I don't think I have a case. If you do, I'll get back to you. And then if you don't, the person is going to say, Well, uh, I'm waiting because I don't think I have a case. Instead of checking with someone else, you're relying upon the attorney's advice. Now, the attorney will want to say this is all preliminary. Isn't that what he says? Uh, this is just a discussion we were having. She was uh, coming to us to ask whether or not we would represent her. We're still in the active process of making that determination. Uh, so there's no damage here because we have no obligation. There's no attorney-client relationship form. Yes? Yeah, I think he tried to make it sound like he said something more along the lines of it wasn't something that we would be interested in. Yes. And rather than either, he should have either said, we can't do it, or right. I don't know if we have a case. I have to do more research to get back. I mean, like, he left it open. Right, that's good. And so notice, this, that's a key distinction in this yeah. case. Uh, the attorney Miller keeps referencing the attorney's discretion to accept this case. We, we're trying to figure out whether we would uh, accept it or not. Uh, and but. He's not really focusing on that he did make a substantive uh, assessment or evaluation of the claim. I don't think you have a case. So that's what starts, and then I'll get back to you if you do. And since he doesn't, he also doesn't inform the client about the statute of limita- limitations. So without really doing any necessary research to really assess this claim, you make this categorical conclusion that I don't think you have a case. That's bad. You haven't assessed whether or not this claim is even viable because it happened 14 months later. <coughs> so you have to, even in this initial uh, discussion, even if you say go somewhere else, you have to make some reference to the statute of limitations. Uh, there is a statute of limitations. You should check that to see if this claim is even viable. That's okay, but didn't say anything about that. And so what about this expert testimony about what the attorney should have done? And what's devastating, I think, about this case is that uh, the experts on either side uh, on either side of the case agree that uh, Miller's conduct fell below that of what we would expect of attorneys. What, what about that? How do we establish malpractice? Uh, so we're going to use this uh, uh, expert testimony to tell us whether or not there's malpractice. 
So, you notice in, in terms of uh, liability, we have to set up these components. The first is that an attorney client relationship exists. That's why we keep going over these factors. Right? <coughs> Second is that there was some office for negligence or breach. So the attorney was supposed to do something and, and followed it up. Approximate cause. And so these acts that the attorney did were the approximate cause of the plaintiff's damages. And then the but for. This is the case within the case. So you have the, the attorney's actions causing damage, but then we want to know this liability attached and can a remedy be afforded for this injury. That's the but for. But for defendant's conduct, the plaintiff would have been successful in the prosecution of their medical malpractice plan. So you see how that could be a very difficult, this case within the case. Usually you can get all three, attorney client, negligence, yeah, there was, this caused it, but then how do we connect what the attorney did to the injury? But for. But for defendant's conduct, plaintiff would have been successful. I was successful in a med mal action. So that's the case within the case. And the court finds, affirms this uh, verdict, this big verdict. $649,000, almost $650,000. So how does the court conclude that this suit for malpractice is successful? Take us through the elements, tell us about tort or contract uh, theories, and then how does the court ultimately affirm this $650,000 verdict? And see, the, all of these factors that we listed up here are gonna go into establishing those claims for medical malpractice. So number one, how do we determine that an attorney-client relationship exists? Yeah. I'm sorry? Okay, so what do they point to in the record, in the record that shows us that there's this, this relationship? Because the, and the reason I'm asking this question is because the attorney keeps saying, and we all probably consider this, you just came to my office, I don't have to accept these cases, uh, we were just talking, we talked for just an hour, uh, and it, it, the outcome was indecisive. I said I'll get back to her, she had a case. Uh, he even says I talked to some people in the firm, Abbas, I think is his name, H B A A S. I talked to some people in the firm, and they said that uh, no real claim, so I didn't get back to her, and, that, and that's fine. Uh, so from the attorney's vantage point, there was no relationship. Why does the court reject that type of argument, this one? We have to assume that that moment is true. Right. And so, and, and also, we're going to look at what the uh, potential client believed. And she believed uh, she was getting information. And so, even though there's no fee arrangements discussed, no contract signed, there's an attorney client relationship. And I guess the basis of that is that she relied upon the attorney's advice. And by relying upon that attorney's advice, she did not seek any other legal advice until the statute of limitations had run. So, you see that on the bottom of page 184. So even though the lawyer and client have different understandings of what this meeting is about, this one points out we have to accept what the client, the prospective client thought in order to establish this. So an attorney-client relationship existed. What about this breach? What list the things that this attorney did wrong? You you would never uh, approach it this way, I know. So what what things? If you had a list of the things that the attorney did that was negligent or breached the contract, what would you say? Uh, he didn't follow up with her. I'm sorry. He didn't follow up. He never got back to her. Right. That's 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 a big one. Communication. But if you get back to her, you would have to have something to say. So what should he have done before you even called her back, Ms. Moore? Research. Research. Yeah. Statute of limitations. Get the hospital records. Make an assessment about the viability of this claim. And so that's what the expert testimony does. And that's why it's so uh, damning that even his uh, partner says uh, you don't make categorical conclusions. He says if he were consulted for a legal opinion regarding malpractice 14 months after the event occurred, ordinary care and diligence would require him to inform the party of the two-year statute of limitations. So that's, that's, the very, that's why I pointed that out at the very first part of the discussion, which is to say the clock is running, we need to check this. Then you have, uh, it's not doing the appropriate research. You see that on page uh, 186 as well. And then you have uh, the reliance on this attorney's initial assessment that you don't have a case. So what about these tort or contract uh, theories of malpractice? Oftentimes they're in the same complaint, but and the court says here, it says under either theory is malpractice. Well, what's, what's the difference? How do they work? So that's why we have a client lawyer relationship that's present. The jury could find that talks to have received legal advice. And in the event of this advice is a foreseeable injury if this advice is given negatively. We have that. <coughs> and the attorney failed to do minimal research that an ordinarily prudent attorney would perform. Now what about the contract or tort theories? What about that? They're gonna be in both claims usually. Uh, it's usually tort contract, breach of fiduciary duty, all of those. And the court says either or here, I just wanna make sure you, what, what is the distinction between tort and contract? It's a big, uh, Putting on page 13. This is a review of contract law. So since no money passed hands and no contract is formally signed, you still could have a contract theory. Yeah? 
Um, it says for the contract analysis, it would have to be console itself. Right, right. And so that's good. And so that's advice that's not paid for, but notice what we're underscoring, the reliance interest. That's a footnote 13. So the negligence approach really looks at this legal advice and its causal effect, not necessarily at someone's request. Now, she doesn't say I want you to be my attorney explicitly, but we're looking at the impact of that interaction and getting that advice and what that does in terms of uh, causation. They just cite Paul's graph that famous tort case. So you're talking about foreseeability when you talk about tort. Contracts, you are uh, performing a service that is requested, pursuant to another's request, it says in footnote 13. No money has changed hands, but you have this reliance interest because of some information was exchanged. So the court says under either theory, uh, there's liability. And then finally, and this is the most difficult part of a malpractice case, the case will indicate. And here, uh, it's established, but for the defendant's conduct, the plaintiffs would have been successful in the mad malaction. How does the court conclude that? Why well, can't I always make the argument so a mal medical malpractice case or any type of malpractice case against an attorney? That's speculative. So yes, we have this relationship. Yes, there probably was a breach that uh, was directly related to that injury, but we cannot quantify what that injury is, so we throw it, throw it out. Why is it established on these facts? And this is a lot of money, $650,000. $650,000, yeah. Uh, Dr. Woods confirmed that uh, Mr. Clock of injuries were due to medical Okay, so we have a direct connection. We have expert testimony saying that this doctor's uh, standard of care fell below what we would expect. And, it, and so it is on some level, uh, we are on some level able to quantify it. You look on page 188. Dr. Woods in no uncertain terms concluded that Mr. Tuck says injuries were caused by the medical malpractice of Dr. Blake. And so, it, and so the court also goes on to say, well, the defendants put on their own expert testimony as well, that's fine. But ultimately the jury uh, did not uh, believe the defendant's version of the fact that $650,000 affirmed. Now there's some questions after this, a lot of them, but uh, a couple of questions I want to ask. Question two on the top of page 189. Why did Miller, I'm sorry, what did Miller do to be liable for $650,000? Another way to ask, ask that question is, do you think that this is fair? $650,000? I'm trying to make you feel sorry for the attorney. $650,000 liability for sitting down, talking an hour, and saying, well, uh, I'm not sure, you may not, you may not have a case, I'll get back to you. This fair? The book asks? So the book, okay, Mrs. Toss asked Miller whether she had a case. He gave her his honest opinion that she did not. That's what he thought. He never said he was her lawyer or was willing to become her lawyer. That's what he's thinking. I never said anything. Like they didn't sign any agreement. And she wasn't charged anything, and she gets $650,000. Why is it for the lawyer, not the doctor? The doctor is going to get it. So is this fair? No? Or yeah? Yeah? Because he was, he, if he had given the proper diagnosis, if he had been in the plane, they probably would have gotten the word of close his mouth. I mean, it's really the non-legal jury. Mm -hmm. So he has to compensate us for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. That's it. I mean, and, and, <laughs> I don't, I mean, there's no way out really, and that's why we went through the practical dynamics of this interview. You really don't want to be in a situation where, uh, this case is driven by reliance. I mean, and once you comment on the merits of the case, that's it. So I don't want to sort of scare you into never talking to a client and say, oh, I can't talk about that. You give them the options and, and make very clear that uh, these are the options and further research may be made, not, not expressing a full substantive opinion on the validity or value of your claims. We need to do more of that if we're going to be your attorney. Uh, but here, no such uh, condition was set up <coughs> that left them open to liability. So. Yeah. So, like, what level do you go to to protect yourself for consultations of this sort? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because if you, to yeah. me, like, my first thought is, okay, well, you can document this, but, like, as soon as someone signs something saying, oh, this is just a consultation, like, that would almost enter into a gray area. Like, if they mix that up with agreeing to become, a, you know, agreeing to be, um, to have you as their attorney, of, I mean, that's a factor, and then just, like, the administrative cost of that extra paperwork, which I understand it could be important to cover yourself for consultations. But, like, where's that line of where you document exactly? I think, yeah, yeah. I think it's hard. I don't think there's a clear, bright line answer. It's going to be case by case. But, but firms have uh, practices and procedures for initial discussion. So as you said, that preliminary document, you could say we're not expressing uh, an opinion on the validity of your claim. Uh, this is an initial consultation. Of course, you're free to uh, consult other attorneys before you come back to us. Uh, you could also say uh, that uh, this isn't a formal attorney-client relationship, and this is only an initial consultation. We will keep all confidences as we should uh, for prospective clients. That's another thing. Uh, and there have to be more uh, steps uh, taken before you become an actual client. So on some level, you can just go to the model room and sort of track what a prospective client is, put conditions on this interview, not uh, expressing validity on your claim. A number of factors can impact your claim, including statute of limitations, you're coming to us at this time. That's the formal way to do it. But some of your classmates already sort of answered the question as well, and you can say something like this. If it's, you always have to think about competence, and you're thinking about, well, if I, under, if I take this representation on, how much work am I going to have to do? Uh, what is it going to entail? Do I even have the expertise to do it? So another thing in the book is that an attorney can uh, decline a representation. So if after the first couple of minutes you know that this is something that is either going to be too much work and you're not going to be able to do it diligently, competently within the context of the rules? No. Or if it, even if it is something within your expertise uh, and you think that uh, there may be further problems down the road, you can say no. So we always had an option of, of saying uh, we're not going to represent, and that's the clear thing. Uh, but in the context of these discussions, whether you formally document it or you're just talking to the client, you have to make sure that the client knows, uh, unlike the client in talks, that these are the parameters of this initial discussion. I'm performing attorney client relationship yet. This is purely fact finding. I will protect the confidences uh, as I would for a prospective client. 
and things like that. Because this, but if we didn't do this rule yet, but the person who consults with a lawyer about the possibility of forming a client lawyer relationship is a prospective client. And notice this, even if no client lawyer relationship ensues, the lawyer has learned information from the prospective client, shall not reveal that information. So you have to make sure initially that you spell out what these discussions are. So no clear bright line, but I think whether you document it or just talking to the client, you make sure the client knows that this is an initial consultation, no relationship is formed, not expressing an opinion on the validity of your claims, you're free to consult other counsel before making your final decision. Uh, and, if, and if you leave anything hanging out there, like I'll call you back or I'll get, make sure you do it. You're not established, you don't want to establish any reliance interest that someone can say, well, I was waiting on uh, this attorney. That's why uh, we're so uh, concerned about deadlines and responding. This is where attorneys get into the most trouble. You know, competence, communication, you'd be surprised. I mean, this lack of communication can lead to malpractice. You know, there's evidence all the time of attorneys, you know, not returning phone calls for, for a year. And then the client finally catches up with the attorney, and then the attorney has to lie. Well, I've been working on it, and uh, some papers may have gotten displayed, but I'm going down to the court. Uh, so it, it unravels. And so that can be malpractice. So that's why we are uh, so concerned about making sure uh, that communication is real. Let me set up this problem since we kept on. Uh, on page 196, I'm just going to set up this problem, and then we'll talk about it. So everything we have on the board sort of leads us to this washing machine uh, discussion. Uh, talked about expressing applied authority. You, know, you generally need express authority to settle a case. Apparent authority of uh, it's usually only in a scenario where that third party uh, can justify reliance upon uh, the actual statements of a client or other principles. That's on page 191. There is a hypo on page 192 to 193 uh, that talks about the distinction between apparent authority and actual authority. Uh, there you had a negotiation and the client left and told the attorney, uh, okay, you handle it. And then the question was, was that uh, actual authority or apparent authority? After the settlement is reached, the client wants to back out. The state sues for specific performance. The state prevails on specific performance because the client leaves and tells the attorney, uh, you handle it. Uh, that's not apparent authority. That's actual authority. Told the uh, attorney to carry it out. That's the top of page 193. <coughs> then I wanted to sort of point out this case because it comes out of uh, Kentucky as well. On page 194, so this just shows, I'm not trying to scare you anything. This is sort of making you aware of the thing. So this urban cat sees an attorney. You know, a lot of attorneys, he's taught at a law school, he had practiced in this area for a long time, and so he's contacted by a client to obtain loans to buy real estate. And so he's been doing this for years, so he uses forms that he's used all the time with no problem, no problem. He arranged for clients to sign these loan funds. He has a JD, two advanced degrees in tax, practiced law for seven years, so experience. Despite his education and experience, so he didn't double check and do some research, uh, he did not know that the kind of commercial forms that he was using to make loans to consumers violated federal law because of the interest terms in those uh, loan documents. So this was an unintentional mistake. And he was found to violate rule 1.1, confidence, and his license was suspended. But you know, what was interesting in this case was that his extensive experience actually aggravated uh, the confidence claim. It's almost like, yeah, we know that this is unintentional, but you should have known that you should have uh, done a little bit more to determine what type of commercial loan documents you should have used. But I wanted to point that out because look at the footnote, footnote 29. Fairly recent case, 2010. So this happened in another jurisdiction. Then we found about, out about it here. So if you're admitted in multiple jurisdictions, they're gonna find out about it. And so we found out about it in Kentucky and he received reciprocal discipline. So the action occurred in Delaware. He's admitted in Kentucky too. Kentucky finds out about it, the KBA, and he's charged with uh, a conflict of interest because he had represented the lender and had not obtained the necessary form consent. So that's going to be uh, something that we're going to talk about as well. Uh, conflict of interest can lead to malpractice uh, and, and sanctions. So when we come back, we're going to start this problem on 196. I'm not going to go through the facts. We'll go through the facts together. But, but think about this. This is a similar situation that we have with the U.S. Attorney. Think about, and, and there's no real wrong answer to this because the client says, okay, settle it. That's fine. You can just do that. But the question when we come back is, uh, should you just settle it or should you do something more before you decide to settle it? That's what we'll pick up. I'm going to say we can see.